the gospel of our Lord. This is one of those days um, when I read the gospel lesson, I have a hard time at the end of it saying the gospel of our Lord. Did you, did you hear it this morning? Where was the good news, right? Because that's what gospel means. Gospel means good news. But where was that good news at this morning? Did you hear it in there? Was it plain to you in what was happening? You know, we get the story of the vineyard, right? The tenants coming and not giving God what is His. And they kill His servants. He sends more. They kill Him again. He sends the Son. They kill the Son. And then Jesus at the end says that the kingdom of God is going to be removed from you and given to those who have produced good fruit. So just where is the good news? Martin Luther once said that sometimes you have to squeeze a biblical passage until it leaks the gospel. I think this morning is one of those times that we're going to have to do some squeezing to see where the gospel is at in this. Right? Because the story, the landowner plants a vineyard, builds a wall, digs a wine press, builds a watchtower, does everything he needs to do to gather a good harvest, and then he leases it to tenants and he goes away. For how long does he go away? Well, I don't really know that much about vineyards, but I do know that it takes a while for a vine to grow large enough for it to produce grapes. Right? It's not, probably not a one-season thing. And one of the books that I saw... It's called The Law in the New Testament. According to this book, the time between planting the vineyard and the first payment to the landowner was probably about five years. Yeah, that's a long time, right? As tenants, you've been working this vineyard for five years, and now the landowner comes back to, to get the fruit. And how much fruit did he come to get? Was it a part of it, or was it all of it? Probably all of it. So, at that point then... Do you understand why the tenant did what they did? I've been working this land for five years and now this guy who's gone off and not done anything on this land comes back and says he wants me to give him everything that's here? Really? I mean, isn't that how all of us would react? Isn't that what we would do? Can we not understand the reaction of the tenants to the slaves that are, or servants that are coming to take all the fruit? We can understand it. But does that make it right? See, the landowner sends his servants when the harvest time comes to collect his due, the share that is owed to him by his legal possession of the land. And the tenants then, they beat, they stone, they kill the servants. So the landowner then sends more servants, the, the story tells us. Not just the same amount of servants, he sends more servants. And they do the exact same thing to them. And then the landowner sends the son. The landowner sends his sons and the tenants see him and they say, Ah, this is the heir. Let's kill him so that we can get the vineyard for ourselves. Because they're assuming the landowner is going to stay away long enough that he's going to die and not come back to take claim on the land that he has. They will get to keep the extra produce for themselves, not just for this year, but forever. Well, what's your first thought on that right there? It's crazy. It's absolutely 100% crazy. Don't they know that their scheme is going to come unraveled at some point, somehow? I mean, the tenants here are just completely nuts in what they're thinking. Is this really going to work? Don't they see that eventually this whole thing is just going to unravel all around them? This is the way Jesus thinks, because Jesus asked this question at the end of this parable, right? Jesus asked the question, when the owner of the vineyard returns, what will he do to the tenants? And then the reply is, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give the produce at the time of the harvest. And who said that? Who answered that question? Was it Jesus? This is yes, this means no. Who answered the question? Was it Jesus? Jesus asked the question, but then who answered it? It doesn't actually say in our story, but if you remember last week's gospel, we talked about he was talking to the Pharisees and the leaders. And last week's gospel goes right into this week's gospels. So last week's gospels began with the question of the Pharisees and the leaders 
of the, the Jewish high council asking Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? So he's still explaining to them by what authority he does these things. So it's the Pharisees and the high council leaders that say the landowner will put the tenants to a miserable and wretched death. And by answering it, they condemn themselves. As they answer, they do not realize that they are actually the tenants. But when they figure it out at the end of the gospel, they want to take Jesus and have him arrested and do what the tenants did to the slaves and to the son. So, where is the good news? But it's in there. It's all about how this crazy parable comes about and what we see in it and who the landowner actually is. We think about it. Why on earth do these tenants actually think that they're going to inherit this vineyard. Is it possible? Absolutely it's possible. Right? They have possession. And in Jesus' day, if possession is something that you have and the landowner actually dies, then you could become the legal owner of that property. So yes, it is legally possible that the landowner dies and there's no heir that the tenants who are living on that land could obtain possession of the land. It is legally possible. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. But the landowner has not disappeared or forgotten about the land. He's actually sent servants, not just once, but twice. And he sent his own son. Who's to say he doesn't have another son? Or more servants? Or an army? Or at least a group of friends that are willing to go with him to take care of the tenants that just killed his servants and his son? I mean, who's to say? The tenants are simply crazy, as we've already mentioned and already established. But they're not the craziest ones in this parable. I would have to say that the tenants are not actually half as crazy as the landowner is. Right? Think about it just for a minute. The landowner, it comes time for him to collect his harvest. What does he do? He sends his servants to collect his harvest. That's you know, not out of the norm. And what happens? They are beaten. They're stoned. They're killed. So then he thinks, all right, it was just a fluke, so I'll send some more servants. They didn't actually mean it. It's okay. So he sends more servants. If you were the landowner, and you sent servants to your land to pick up your portion of the harvest, or all of the harvest, and the tenants there killed your servants, what would you do? Would you send more servants? I... I would call the police. (laughs) Or the National Guard. (laughs) Or a group of people with the middle name Z, right? You know, you you send a bunch of people that are going to take care of the problem. You're not going to send more servants that are probably going to wind up getting killed again. But this landowner sends more slaves. And he did send more than he did the first time. The reading tells us that. He sent more slaves than he did the first time. And they still did the same thing to them. They beat them. They stoned them. They killed them. So then after all of this, he still doesn't seem to understand what's going on. He says, well, I'll send my son because obviously they're not getting it with the servants. He sends his son, his heir. And according to the text, his son goes alone. He sent slaves, servants, servants, plural. The second time he sent more servants, plural. The third time, he sends his son. Period. One son, one person to go and deal with the tenants. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Who would do such a thing? None of us would. No one actually would, except maybe a crazy landowner who is so desperate to be in relationship with the tenants who are using his land. That he will do anything, he'll risk anything to reach out to those people. This landowner acts more like a desperate parent, willing to do, to say, to try anything, to reach out to a beloved wayward child than he does a businessman. Right? It has absolutely nothing to do with business. It's all about wanting to be in a relationship with the people who are using his land. And he's acting much more like a parent who would reach out to a child who seems to be going a wayward way from where the parents want them to go than he does acting in a way 
that will get him his due, his crop, his money. It's the crazy kind of love that comes from being head over and heels in love. It's the craziness of being in love. So the question that Jesus asked them, what will the landowner do when he comes? Get the answer. He'll put those wretches to a miserable death. Right? The Pharisees convict themselves in this question. But maybe the question isn't the right question. Maybe the question shouldn't have been, what will the landowner do when he comes? The question should be, what did the landowner do when he came? You see, the landowner loved the tenant so much that he sent his servants, the prophets, to come and to tell them that they had gone wayward and to give back to God what was his. And what did they do to the prophets? They beat them. They stoned them. They killed them. So what did what did the landowner do? He sent more servants. He sent more prophets. And what did they do to the more prophets? They beat them. They stoned them. They killed them. We did this. Not just those people a long, long time ago. But we did it. And then this landowner sent his son, his one and only son. And why? Because God so loved the world that he sent his only son. To show all of us who have hoarded God's blessings for ourselves and not given back to God what God has given to us to share graciously and equally with everybody else in the world. And when God sent his only son, what did we do? We killed him. But after we killed him, God raised him up from the dead and sent him back to us to tell us again, hello, you're not getting this right, you need to pay attention. He sent him back to us one more time, still bearing to us the message of God's crazy and desperate love for each and every one of us. God is so crazy in love with us that he sent his only son to show us how we've got it all messed up so that we may not perish, but have eternal life is John 3.16, right? If you know John 3.16, how many of you know John 3.17? They've actually listened before. That's good. John 3.17, I think, is much more important than John 3.16 ever is. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, that all who believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.17 is, Indeed, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but that in order that the world might be saved through him. God didn't send his son, a landowner didn't send his son to condemn the the tenants. God sent his son so that we might understand who God is and how we all have a relationship with him and just how desperately and crazy in love with each and every one of us God actually is. And through that crazy love, the landowner, our father, he loves each and every one of us. It's love offered not only once, not twice, but a million times or more for all who will receive it and all who turn to ask for it. So live out your lives in that gracious, crazy love that God has for each and every one of us, knowing that He's given it to you and He'll continue to give it to you. Not to hoard to yourself, but to share with everybody else that you come in contact with. Because that's why God gave you that love. Not to keep it for yourself, but to show others that they can also have that love. So go out into the world and share that crazy love that God has already shared with you.